So let's go ahead and begin. Um, doesn't look like Bethany signed in yet. Sarah, I don't believe, is going to make it because she's not feeling well. <clears throat> so there are five of you and what, 140 lines? Stickers. Oh, 150. Um, so you'll each get to do quite a bit. I've got three different things I'm trying to juggle here, and I've got a very small space um, in front of me. I'm just trying to think how to begin. Um, let's just jump in the poem, and we'll stop at various points or a variety of points. Um, hold on, we've got to get the screen there. Okay. Uh, we'll stop at a variety of points where I will stop you at various points to um, discuss some issues. I hope you read the introduction well, and as you work through the translation or translating it, you look um, carefully at the notes that are in the bottom, because there are, I don't know if you say, a few, several um, interesting problems in this poem. Um, some of them having to do with meter, which I don't think are as important as, as some other issues, um, others having to do with emendation and such, and what's the quote-unquote proper or correct um, text of the poem, so to speak. And, and to be honest, we can't really answer that question because we don't have anything to compare it to. This is, this is the only version that exists other than the little bit that is on... Um, the Real Cross, which I'm going to talk about briefly, and I've got a couple pages to pull up. So, since there are five of you, tell you what, we'll break it up into smaller sections. Rather than having each of you just do 30, 30 lines off the top, um, why don't you each do 15? And so, somebody, I won't bother reading it in Old English. Somebody can be, begin with line one and finish with, at the end of 16a, Yagir admit Golda. Okay, Chelsea? Hold on a second. My sounds from way down. Okay. Um, yeah, do the, poli do the polished, but do it kind of slow because I'm probably going to interrupt you. If, for the simple reason that I love this poem. This, this poem is just gorgeous. Um, and so I want to make sure that you all agree with me. Anyways, okay, go ahead. Let I once tell the best dream that dreamed to me at midnight when the voice bearers dwell at rest. Okay, stop there for a minute. What's the purpose of translation? To anybody, not just to Chelsea. What are you, what are you trying to do when you translate from one language into your modern the language you normally speak. What's the purpose of that? Understanding. Okay. Text. Understanding the text to make it clear. What else? Conveying the original meaning. Conveying the original the meaning. Okay. Line three. Rared bearing. What does that, how did you translate that again, Chelsea? Voice bearers. Voice bearers. It's also translated speech bearers. That's what it literally is. But what does it mean? What is it? What does it refer to? What's the men? People. Okay. That's an example of a kind of a kenning, right? It's describing humans without calling them humans. Okay, so it's it's describing them by an attribute they have. So the point I'm trying to get at is, does the poet want us to hear simply speech bearers or to understand the term speech bearers, or does the poet want us to understand, you know, while people were sound asleep? The second one. You think it's a second? I, I agree. I mean, I, I think that, idea is to convey 
all of humanity is asleep except for me, the dreamer. Okay, but he uses speech bearers. Why? Or rarer baron? Why? To me, like one of the elements of it was that, uh, well, like the the whole poem is about listening, so it kind of has a certain amount of connotation about people talking too much. And, yeah. Okay. True. Also, like speech is the one thing that distinguishes humans from other animals. True. Though even in this period and earlier, they would say rationality is one of the hallmarks of quote unquote. Uh, being made in the image of God. Look at the next word. Resta. He uses rare therein for alliteration. Because resta is the first accented syllable of the second half line, and that's the that's the sound that determines the alliteration for the entire line. So he's got to think, he's got to the, the poet has got to have a word that alliterates with that resta, okay? Rarer bearing, voice bearing, speech bearing, works just as well. And I don't remember, I haven't looked. I don't think that's a, oh, what's the word? Um, there's a word that describes when a word is only used once in a poetic corpus. Pretty sure that it shows up in other texts. I'm just checking to see if it shows up in other places. In um, it looks like it does show up in one of the Kinnewolf poems. Yeah, Christ. Okay. Um, go ahead. Go on. It seems to me that I saw the most wondrous tree born up into the sky with light wrapped around it, the brightest of trees. That beacon was all drenched with gold. Beautiful gems appeared at the corners of the earth. Likewise, there were five above in the shoulder. Okay, stop there for a moment. Conceptual. Think of that image. Okay, so he's he has a dream, let's say, of this cross, and he says, um Stoden Feira at Folden Shatter, which you translated as something like beautiful gems stood at the corners of the earth. Right? How? What what He's telling us something about the cross there. Hold on, I'm going to shut these blinds. What's he saying about the cross? How big is it, for example? Okay. How do you know? I mean, you're right. Because the gems are on like the edges of the cross, so. What, what is the speaker's physical position? Is he standing up, sitting down? Yeah, the implication is he's lying down. And he looks down towards his feet, and there's the foot of the cross. Okay? And he looks as far as he can back over his head, and there's the head of the cross. And he looks as far as he can to the left, and there's one arm of the cross, and as far as he can to the right, and there's the other. Okay, so the vision of the cross is, the cross is huge, and the four points of the cross touch the horizons. Okay? Notice, by the way, also what that image is, is doing. So he's lying there, and he sees above him this image of the cross stretched out. It's like the dreamer is also stretched out on the cross. Exactly. Okay? So, um, is there anything else to discuss? Round and light. Da, 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 da. What are the gems? Any guesses? I guess it would be that they represent where the nails were. Okay. 
Could be, because we're told there's five. Five were up on that axle span. Now, the axle span is referring to the cross beam, kind of literally, but it's, it's kind of, I think it's also alluding to the entire cross. Well, one, two, feet, three, four, crown of thorns, possibly five, or spear in the side, five, okay? Um, pick up there with line 9B, which is where you left off. He held all, he held all the Lord's angels beautiful by decree. There was not truly a criminal's gallows, but there beheld holy spirits, men over the earth in all this glorious creation. Okay, stop there for a minute. Um, in 11, there beheld holy spirits Who's doing the beholding? Who's doing the seeing? The dreamer, the speaker. No. Yeah. Look at the tense of the, uh, look at the, the number of the verb. It's a plural verb. It's the, it's the, yeah, it's the Hallegagostas that are doing the beholding. So the Holy Spirits are looking down and they're doing the watching, okay? And then you get men over the earth and all this glorious creation. So are they looking at the cross and men on this earth and all the glorious creation? Or is it the Holy Spirit, men over all create men on earth and all creation are beholding the cross? That is, we have three subjects essentially watching the cross, looking at the cross interesting problem okay and that by the way 9b is one of the cruxes of the poem because metrically it doesn't work well right. it it shouldn't have metrically that word at the end the Allah, which is why many editors just remove it to to make the work to make the line work um metrically and and there's a lot of dispute as to what is the angel of the Lord being referred to? He held there an angel of the Lord, all fair through creation, et cetera, et cetera. Is the angel of the Lord Christ? Is it somebody beholding something else? Okay. Um, okay, so pick up after the yeshaft and go to the 16B. 13? Yeah, that's, yeah, 13, okay. I think where you left off. So that's, the victory tree was wonderful, and I was stained by sins, badly wounded with faults. I saw the tree of glory, ennobled garments, shine with joys, adorned with gold. Okay. So, now, notice now the speaker refers to himself. And it's kind of the first time other than the dream, this dream came to me. Because if we go back to the beginning... I will tell you the most beautiful dream that is that came to me. So it's almost like he's saying, you know, this isn't just a regular old dream. This is a vision that came to him, right? And now he says, beautiful, wondrous, however you want to translate silich that has the right meaning, was the victory tree or tree of victory and i sinon fa fa it's an interesting um adjective or interesting word because of how it gets used in a variety of different contexts and places we're going to see it in beowulf for example used to describe a road it's going to be used to describe the interior of a house here it's used to describe an individual and I was, how did you translate it? Stained. Stained in sins. It often is used uh, or translated as adorned or ornamented, clothed. And I, clothed, adorned, stained in sins, for wounded. And the four there is an intensifier. So badly wounded with, how did you translate, woman? He gives us faults. 
What word that we have in modern English is related to woman? Woes. Wounded with woes. I saw the tree of glory, okay, exalted in wadum, weeds. They would, not weeds in the modern sense, weeds in the old Elizabethan and earlier sense, meaning dressing, clothing, adornments, right? Shinon, uh, winum shinon, and you've got a gloss at the end of line 15, shining with joy, so in joys, if you want, yagirid, adorned with gold, right? So have we seen any other description so far of the cross? Have we seen, have we heard anything about blood? No, back on what? Where? Not yet, okay? Because in line seven, it's begotten mid gold, it's covered in gold, it's got gems on five points, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Then we get to down here, adorned with gold. Okay, so line 16B, somebody pick up this and go to, hopefully it'll break up just about right. Um, 30, go to the end of 31. Hera Vergas Heba on page 196. Okay. Okay. Well, Elizabeth. And go slowly so I can interrupt you. Okay. Gems had splendidly covered the ruler's tree, yet I could perceive beyond that goal the former struggle of the wretched ones, and that it first began to bleed on the right side. Okay, stop there. So Jim's, Jim's had covered it in the wilderness trail, and that's another line that has problems. Um, Marsden has emended it here because the manuscript reads wildness trail, the tree of the forest. And I was looking at another edition. Where is it? The one I used when I took this class has a note that says, although wildest trail, a near tree of the forest, that's the translation, is difficult metrically, it makes excellent sense. Furthermore, if we were to take it as standing in deliberate opposition to the phrase wildest trail in 14b, which is coming up, um, excuse me, which we went past already, then this contrast would embody a notion which occurs frequently in this poem. An idea in the poem in lines 4b, 27b, and 90 and follow, and elsewhere in literature connected with the cross. So Cassidy and Ringler, in their revision of Bright's Old English Grammar, they suggest the manuscript version of Wildest Trail actually makes good sense. Metrically, it's deficient. It, it needs an additional syllable, right? We, the issue this kind of raises is who's better able to understand the meter of a poem written in Old English? Somebody who reads and writes it daily or a scholar a thousand years removed? who has studied the language, but doesn't live it, doesn't eat, breathe, think, etc. I'm, I'm one of those who very, very hesitant to amend a text unless it is just a glaring, my dissertation was an edition of the Holy Sonnets of John Donne, um, unless it's just a glaring error. Like in the case of, um, oh, what was it we did last time? Um, Dior, where you have a word that is not a word in old English. Uh, manga, it's, it's not a word. It's gotta be amended to something because it doesn't show up in any other place. And we have no idea what it means, okay? But this, this original reading, Wildest Trail, makes very good sense. 
In, in fact, if you go by that principle, I think I've mentioned it before, of Lectio Difficilior, the more difficult reading, the more difficult reading is Wilder's Trail, in which case it's probably more likely to be the original reading. Because when somebody is copying something, if, if the copyist doesn't understand it, what the copyist will tend to do is to simplify it, to make it more understandable. Copyists aren't usually, well, I won't say this well, me as a copyist, because I'm not a natural poet. If I were copying something, I would probably say, you know, if I didn't understand it, I would modify it. But the poet probably would understand it, okay? Um, let's see. Um, the next couple of lines. Notice what begins to happen. As the speaker looks at the tree, what starts to happen? He says, I was able to perceive what? What, what did it seem he could start to see in the tree? He said the struggle. So when he says the wretched ones, I took that to mean uh, Christ and the cross itself. Okay. Okay. When it first began, Okay, line 20, what did the tree start to do then? To, to bleed on the right side. To bleed on the right side. Okay, so he's looking at it, and he perceives, he goes beyond, because the implication is not necessarily that it is literally starting to bleed, but that the speaker is kind of seeing into the history of the tree and kind of metaphorically moving back in time, right? On the right side. Um, Elizabeth, pick up with 20B. Okay. Um, I was entirely afflicted with sorrows. I was frightened before that beautiful sight. I saw that eager beacon change in respect of garments and colors. At times it was drenched with wetness, soaked with blood flow. At times it was adorned with treasure. Okay, stop there. Yet I... Oh, yeah, go ahead and stop there. So, notice he's looking at the tree, and he starts to see the blood, and he says, I was entirely afflicted with sorrow. Well, earlier we saw, you know, he saw the, the old struggle on the tree. Well, that struggle, when, when he sees the tree start to bleed, notice what happens to that struggle. It becomes his struggle. It becomes the speaker's struggle, okay? And then he says, Then he saw the eager tree begin to change. And, and what does it do? It changes back and forth, right? Sometimes it looks like it's just drenched with blood. And notice, by the way, the word that's used for blood is modern English what? Sweat. So when we talk about blood, sweat, and tears, it's blood, blood, and tears, etymologically speaking, right? So he sees it, you know, drenched in blood, and then he sees it covered in gold and gems. Well, how? How can that be? Is, is it literally, you know, trip, trip, back and forth? Or is the blood the rich jewels that are on the tree, metaphorically speaking? I mean, if one accepts the Christian story, then the blood is are the very gems that are covering the tree. Um, Okay, pick up with 24. Yet I, lying there for a long time, beheld distress the tree of the Savior, until I heard that it spoke. When the 
this tree began to speak in words. Okay, stop there. So that introduces the prosopopoeia, where you have an inanimate object speak. Okay, and there's a couple of other poems, um, other than riddles, within the Old English corpus that do that. There are numerous riddles, you know, I am, blah, 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 tell me what I am, kind of thing. Some of them very risque. So we get the introduction to the tree. So the dreamer tells us, I was lying there a long while. So he lies down, or he has the dream, the dream comes to him around midnight, we're told, and he sees this image, and then he hears a voice from it, okay? And the tree says, uh, begin Elizabeth, you go to, what did I say, 31? Yeah, end of 31. So that was the are you. That was once long ago. I still remember that, that I was hewn down from the end of the forest, removed from my root. Uh, is that where you're stopping, or did you have one more line? I thought you had uh, one more. Okay, sure. Uh, let's see. Strong enemies seized me there. They made me there into a spectacle for themselves. Ordered me to raise up their criminals. Okay, that's good. That was Yaru. It was a long time ago. Almost introducing what kind of element? Once upon a time. It's, I'm not saying it is a fairy tale element. But it's, it, it has that kind of sound to it, okay? Notice what else this is telling us. The, the tree is obviously still alive, even though it was removed from its roots an awful long time ago, okay? It was an awful long time ago, I still remember it, that I was hewn down, holtus on in from the forest, etc. you know, removed by my root, Took me then stronger fiendas, strong fiends, enemies. Okay, and what did they do? They ordered me to be what? What was your translation again for a hair of awareness? To hold up their enemies? To raise up their yeah, to raise up their criminals. Okay, somebody else pick up with thirty-two. So we have about fifteen lines, and go to oh, perfect. Go to the end of forty-seven B. It ends with Nani Gun Shedan. Oh, sorry, Lenny. Did you want to go? There was like three of us that I muted at one time. Um, I'll go ahead unless you just were. It doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter to me if you want to go ahead. That's totally cool. I'll go ahead. Right. All right. So they carried me on there on their shoulders to a hill and fixed on me many of their enemies. I observed there the Lord of humankind hurry with great fortitude to climb up on me. Okay. Stop there. I did not dare. Stop there for a minute. Okay. So. Look at the description of Christ. How did he approach the cross? Cross, not crossed. He hurried he to the hurried. cross. He hurried to do what? Yestigen. How did you translate Yestigen? I had it to climb up. To climb up, okay? Like He's rushing to the cross and getting ready to just, you know. Not the kind of depiction you get of Christ in the later Middle Ages period, where you get this emphasis on the suffering passive Christ, the, the suffering servant image of Isaiah 53. This is your, you know, uber germanic hero image he's getting ready to do battle his battle is on the cross right so pick up with 35. Sorry, let me right there. i 
did not dare bend or break against the Lord's word and shook as I observed the earth's surface. As all my enemies were knocked down, still I stood fast. The young hero, God Almighty, stripped himself strong and resolute. Okay, stop there for a minute. He climbed up the Stop there for just a minute. So why why does the cross offer, you know, this notion, um, I dare not bend down before the Lord or before the word of the Lord? Why why might he bow down? Well, one reason he could acknowledge divinity. Okay, so. that's one reason he's acknowledging who Christ is within the world of the bomb. Um, why else? I mean, that would be a reason for bowing down. But he says, "I dare not bow down." Okay, so the reason for bowing down, your God. Okay, so why why doesn't he fall flat on his can't say face you know, trunk? No. But the cross has a role to perform. Bingo. He's being a faithful thing here. And a lot of critics have a problem with this. One of you, in fact, one of your articles uh, addressed this issue. I don't remember whose. You know, where the, art, the author of article essentially kind of questioned the heroic status of the cross because it was saying, He's not acting like a good thing because a good thing, if you follow that fourfold Germanic ethic that C.L. Rand talks about, a good thing is going to defend his Lord. True. But a good thing is also going to obey his Lord's commands. And if the Lord's commands are, don't defend me, that kind of puts the thing, you know, between the proverbial rock and hard place, right? Because if I'm ordered not to defend you and I defend you, then I've gone against your word. Okay? which is kind of worse than, you know, not fitting. We're going to see the same idea play out in Beowulf, right? So, and he says, you know, even though I could have, what's he saying he could have done? I could, yeah, I could have killed all those enemies. I could have taken them all out, but I stood fast. I don't know how he could have taken out all the enemies. It's interesting imagery, like, I don't know, Yoda Jiu-Jitsu or something, right? And then, on Girida Hinatha Yeong Halif. What's on Girida again? He stripped himself. So Christ comes up to the cross, pulls his clothes off, okay? The young Caliph hero. So he strips himself, and then look at the next half line. And here we're getting into, I think at least, and there's an article, and I don't remember if one of you did this. I think one of you did. An article by a uh, guy's last name is Grasso. It's about ritual reenactment or something like that. He strips himself, showing obviously what? Humanity, right? This isn't, you know, um, we, we see all kinds of images of the crucifixion, for example. And there's a guy hanging on the cross with a little loincloth. No. In a Roman crucifixion, there was no loincloth. That was part of the humiliation of the crucifixion, okay? So he strips himself totally naked, and then humanity, and then second half of the line, that was God Almighty. The poet's doing something here. He's emphasizing, for lack of a better phrase, doctrinal purity. He's got them. This individual is both fully man, look at him, okay, and fully God. And we're going to see this kind of balance over the next several lines. And I think the balance is there for a couple of reasons. One, is having to do with the purpose of the poem, and another is having to do possibly with some of the beliefs of the intended audience. Okay, so that was God Almighty, strong and resolute, 
pick up with 40B, Lane. He climbed up the cross, prayed to all who saw him. Then he would redeem man. I struggled with him and embraced me, but I did not dare bend the ground or fall to the earth. I had to stand back. Okay, stop there. There. The cross. Oop. I was one that Lady. raised and lifted by the mighty King of Heaven. I okay, you were breaking up, but I think we all we all heard you. Okay, so no, that's fine. <laughs> It's okay, it's Zoom. Um, so he ascends the cross. Why? A Walda Mankin Lusun. Lusun, your gloss tells you redeem. Which that's is what it means. But it's the same word as we get at the end of the very end of the Lord's Prayer. A lus us of evil. A loose us, set us loose of evil. So he would loosen mankind from the snares, from the bonds, etc. Okay. And the cross then says, before the Ichta may said beyond Imclipta. May Dorstich Father Bugen, again, I dared not. Bugen, bow down to the earth, fall to the ground. But I shield fast to stand. And notice, I had to stand fast. That implies there's some kind of compulsion. Right? That the cross desires to fall down, to let Christ off the cross, but he can't. And then we get the, well, just translate. I'll talk about it later. Uh, so 44. A cross was I raised and lifted by the mighty King of Heaven. I did not dare bend myself. Okay, they stop. pierced me. Or Is it a cross? I was, I was raised and the arrared. It's reared. Modern English reared. Okay, a hoof itch reached not kinning. I raised up the mighty King of Heaven. Not the mighty King of Heaven raised me. I raised up the mighty King of Heaven. So I do kind of like, I'm not picking on Lady, I do kind of like the mistranslation because Christ also raised up the cross, right? I mean, the theology makes all the trees and everything, so he raises the cross so that the cross can raise him, um, King of Heaven. Uh, dare not bend myself. Okay, pick up with 46. I don't even remember where you're going to. I think I'm supposed to stop at 46B. Okay. So, so 47B. 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 They pierced me with dark nails and scars became visible from my open malicious wounds. Keep going. Um, but I did not dare harm any of them. Perfect. Okay. Um, so the cross says, I was pierced with dark nails. Where'd the nails go first? Through Christ. Yeah, through Christ. He doesn't say, you know, they pierced him there with nails. The cross, the cross is doing what? It's identifying with Christ. Okay. But I still... I didn't do anything to them, all right? So somebody pick up with 48 to Samaritan and go to hopefully the end of 62, right? Yeah, 62B, uh, Stralin for Wunda. Carla, you want to do that? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Just let me get the That's fine. more polished one pulled up. Uh, uh, they mocked us united. I was all drenched with blood, so 
soaked with blood from that man's side until the spirit had been sent forth. Okay, stop there. I have suffered many cruelly bad. I had suffered many. Sure. Yeah, just stop there for a minute. Notice the unk. Okay, we don't have a dual pronoun in modern English. Besmiridin here unk butu at gadra. They mocked. What's the real word? They smeared us. That is, they they threw insults at us. But it's us too. Did they? I mean, if you go back and look at the gospel account, are the Jews and the Romans sitting there going, "Ah, you dirty rotten tree! You're a you know son of poison ivy. You're not a real tree." Or, no, they didn't do anything like that. They mocked Christ. If you're really the Christ, get off the cross. If you're really the Christ, heal yourself. If you're blah blah blah. blah. Again, this is part of the identification on the part of the cross with Christ. Okay. Um, I was, you know, covered with blood, etc. He got from that man's side. Seven he have got his cast on sin. Now your gloss says for seven when, when he sent his spirit on. Is it when? Is it since? Is it after? Well, I mean, he was bleeding before he died. He's hanging on the cross for three hours. Blood streaming down his arms, not his ankles, and down from his forehead and stuff, right? Um, okay, then pick up with 50, Fiala Itch. Okay. Um, sorry. Well, That's okay. Yeah, there's, uh, I just noticed that um, I not polished one. There's something... Uh, no, oh, okay. Uh, I saw the God of Hosts. Yes, I heard you. Uh, auto correct. Uh, harshly racked. Uh, the Lord's corpse shining with splendor, hidden in the darkness by, by the clouds. Shadows went forth, dark under the clouds. All creation wept, lamenting uh, Christ the King's death on the cross. Yeah, stop there. Stop there. Okay, so. Fela itch on down there, that you didn't have a. Rather weary. You've got a big long gloss down there. What line is that? 950. Right? Many cruel events, he says, happen on that hill. I saw where the gold. I saw God of hosts. What? Suffer harshly. There's that idea again of human and divine. God of hosts, Lord of hosts, that's a very Old Testament biblical idea. But you never hear in the Old Testament about the God of hosts suffering. Why? Because he can't suffer. So the God of hosts gets shrunk down, so to speak, to this individual. And that could also be elusive to the idea of the Eucharist meal. Okay? Because the, the bread and wine, the bread is referred to in the Latin tradition as the host. So the God of hosts could be elusive to that as well, right? Um, and we have, we have the clouds darken, shadows go forth, dark under the sky. And then we get the thematic center of the poem. It's not the literal center. Because that doesn't come up until about line 72 or so. But the thematic center of the poem, and some of these are the lines on the Rivel Cross in Dumfries, Scotland. Wet all ye shaft. Everything created wet. Or the entire creation, if you want. Wet. Quinton Kinniness filled. Right? They lamented the fall of the king. Christ was on Rhoda. And it's the first time he's labeled. Christ, the anointed one, the suffering one, was on the cross. Okay, pick up with the top of the next page. Rather a therfusa. Uh, yet eager people came from afar to the prince. I uh, beheld all of those. Previously, I was troubled with sorrow. I bent to the hands of those mighty, humble, and zealous men. 
Uh, they lifted Almighty God down from the dire torments. Uh, the warriors left me standing, splattered with moisture. I was wounded with arrows. Okay, stop they, there. Yeah, that's, I think, your, your stopping point. Um, who, who's coming? Who does this? The followers of Christ. Followers of Christ. So in the biblical story, it's Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus come at night and take the, take the body down. Okay? And the cross says, and I, I saw it all. I was there. I witnessed it. They took their, notice the paradox, line 60, almighty God. Okay, if he's almighty, how did they take him, you know? Okay, they lifted him, took him, hefted him, if you want, from that, you know, great torment. Um, and he was all wounded with arrows. Okay, somebody else pick up with 64. A leaden here, their limb weary me. 64 and 15 is going to be somewhere around. In end, 80A, Sara Sorga. Volunteers? Okay. They laid down the limb weary one. They placed themselves at his body's head. There they beheld the Lord of heaven. And he himself rested there for a while worn out after that great struggle. Okay, stop there. So, take him, they lay him down, notice they kind of position themselves around his head, and behold, they're the Lord of heaven, but dead, all right? How dead is he? On he hina ther huila resta. And he rested there a while. Now you could go all Dan Brown and go, he wasn't really dead. He was mostly dead, and he got up later. Okay? It's not what is implied, however. Um, worn out after that great battle. Okay, pick up with 65B, on Gun and him. Then they began to make a tomb, the men in the sight of the slayer. They carved it from bright rock, placed the ruler of victories in there. The wretched men began to sing a sorrow song in the evening when they wished to go back, worn out from the renowned prince. Okay, stop there. So what are they doing? What are they doing when they sing this song? It's a funeral dirge, right? Yeah. In Anglo-Saxon custom, when a hero's dead and buried, or a lord, something like that. The warriors, the the lords, particular house carls or house thanes, the thanes that are closest to them, will ride in a circle around the body. You see, Tolkien do this in the Lord of the Rings, right? When when certain people get buried, they kind of do this. We will see it at the end of Beowulf, for example. So that's what they're doing, right? Um. So they sing this, you know, funeral dirge, etc., and then they go back and they leave him, pick up with whatever that is, 69B, where you left off, and do 69B and on. We rested there with a small company, yet we stood there in position, lamenting a good while, the hero's sound passing away. His corpse grew cold, fair soul-dwelling soul body. Then a man began to strike us down all to earth. That was a dreadful fate. The men buried us in a deep pit. Yet there the Lord's thanes heard about me. They adorned me with gold and silver. Now you might hear, my beloved man, that I have endured the work of evil men, of painful sorrows. Okay, stop there. So, rest the hate there, Matta Wero. Matta Werada with a small company. That's Lytotus. 
How small was the company that Christ rested there with in the tomb? Yeah, zilch. He was by himself. And, and notice the difference between um, this account and the gospel account. Sorry, I took my thing messing with the computer. Because this says they dug a tomb. Right? The gospel's account all says they used a newly dug tomb, a tomb that was already dug, but it was it was there and ready. Okay. And then the cross keeps on speaking and says, men came from afar, people came from afar. Okay. The crosses were it's later on. The crosses were dug, uh, were chopped down, put in a tomb, put in a cave also. And then men came from afar, the Lord's things, line 75b, and found him. What is this an allusion to? Anybody know? The story of St. Helen. Helena, the mother of Constantine the Great. Helena was British, Constantine was British, okay? In Sometime in the early 4th century, 320s, I think it was, um, Helen came to Jerusalem. She spoke to the patriarch of Jerusalem and others. She got it in her head. She was going to find the cross of Christ. They told her where some possibilities were. She had people start digging. And they found multiple crosses, okay? Um, she was told in a vision or something, I can't remember what, the way to determine the cross was real was to have the patriarch of Jerusalem to hold the cross up and for them to bring people who were ill or crippled or something like that to fall under the shadow of the cross. Those that fell under the shadow of the true cross would be healed. If it wasn't the cross of Christ, but say one of the thieves, they wouldn't be healed, okay? Holds the cross, people go under, they're healed. That's the cross of Christ, okay? That's the, the tradition in the church, okay, that how the cross was found. That's what's being described here. Now, that's all, all part of what's called in the literature the cult of the cross. It's all part of the history and the story of um, the cross and such. And notice what the cross says. The things of the Lord found the cross and did what? Girid and made Golda and Silver. They covered me in gold and silver. Why? To make the cross more precious? No. The gold and silver are merely to show the real preciousness of the cross. Okay? It's, it's a way of offering you know, what's you know, worth, so to speak, to the cross. And then notice what, notice the change between 75, 70, I can't tell what lines are. Um, I think 77 and 78, we get a shift, right? Everything before 75, from when the cross first starts speaking, in line 27, so 27 to 77, the cross is talking about what and when. All back then. The crucifixion, first the cross being cut down, then the crucifixion, then the burial of Christ and the crosses in the pits, and then the rediscovery of the cross. 78, the cross moves from talking about the past to the present, new, now. Who might you hear? Now you might hear. And, and what does it really mean? Not only hear, but learn. Now that you might hear and learn, Halleth mean selev. My Lord, the Beloved. That itch baluwara work yabidin haba sara sorga. 
Okay, and you got the parallel genitive nouns are both dependent on work, the sense of which varies. The action of dwellers, dwellers in iniquity, the affliction of painful sorrows. This is what he can now learn about. Okay. So, uh, 80B, if somebody will pick up there and go to. Oops, please, Um, we'll have to break it at the, oh, that works, at the end of 94. So, um, somebody go from 80B to the end of 94. Got that. Okay. Now is the time come that I shall be worshipped far and wide by the people over the earth and all those And all those celebrated, and then the I didn't find a good translation of the Gesiev, um, uh creation gray. Hmm? creation. Okay, and okay, and all those celebrated creation shall pray to this beacon. Okay, stop On there. Stop there for a minute. So now that you might hear or listen and learn, and then the the cross again says now, okay. Now is the time come that what? That I'm worshipped throughout the world, okay, far and wide, men over the earth, and all this fair creation does what? Biddeth them to this sign. So the cross is saying, and now everybody's called. Look at me. All right? On me. Go ahead. Bethany. On me, God's Son suffered a while. Therefore, I now gloriously rise up under heaven, and I may save each one there that has fear for me. Once I was, uh, once I became of punishment uh, strongest to the most hateful people, um, before that, I opened up for them the right way of life as speech bearers. Okay, stop there. So, on me, and this is why he's saying, this is why I'm now the worthiest, or why people worship me. God's son suffered on me for a while. Therefore, I, Thrymphist, glorious now, am under heaven. And it's how in my, I reach my honor authority, and you got a long passage there, okay, uh, I believe it has a clause, to each one or of ones of those who in them in fear is fear towards me or those who have fear for me, all right? I, uh, I was the hardest, if you want, of punishments, laudum lavest, most loathed of people or to people, not the most of the most loathed people. Okay. And I was lavished to people. And if you know anything about crucifixion, it was the worst form of punishment, okay? Because of how it was performed. I mean, it's, it's not just being nailed on the cross, you know, and dying that way. It's the way the crucifixion, a crucifixion was performed is the cross would be flat on the ground. Then the person would be nailed to it lying flat on the ground. Then the cross would get raised like this, and its base, so my palm is the base of the cross, its base would slide into a hole dug in the ground. So it would be lifted up like this and then go boom and drop about three feet. Okay, and the person's not, doesn't have the feet on anything. They're nailed. Wrists are nailed so that when you drop, your wrists are torn or your palms are torn, and the nails tear through your ankles and your shoulders dislocate. And when your shoulders dislocate like that, all you can do is kind of go, oh. you can't get a full, you can't get your lungs full of air, which is why it could take two or three days to die because you're breathing, but you're not breathing quite enough. It's not the pain that kills, it's suffocation that kills. 
that's why, according to the, the gospel account, the reason, you know, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, excuse me, asked for Pilate to send his troops to break their legs was because it was holy day, it was the Sabbath, and they couldn't have people hanging on the crosses on the Sabbath. So they go to break their legs because the breaking of the legs sends a person into shock and death then becomes immediate. Um, so before he, da, 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 cross says, I opened up the way to, and then we get the phrase again, rare barren. So to humanity, to people, it's, it should be properly translated that way. So go on with what? What made the uh, made the uh, made the prince honored above the trees of the forest as the kingdom of heaven's guardian, just as he, Almighty God, did did for his and Jesus's mother also, Mary herself. God before all men honored above all womankind. Okay, so stop there. So, what have we seen? We've seen Christ go to the cross, we've seen Christ crucified, we've seen Christ died, and then the speaker goes on and talks about Mary, right? We start to see, if you're familiar with it, a parallel with, I think I pulled it up, with, share screen, with, where is it? Nope, it's not up here. Hold on a second. Exit full screen. That's it. I'll share screen. With the Nicene Creed, right? So I've got it pulled up. Um, we've, we've heard God, Father Almighty referred to, Creator, we've heard that, talked about Christ, et cetera, et cetera. Um, heard him talk not necessarily about light of light, et cetera, but the idea comes through. Crucifixion, right? Born of the Virgin Mary, that's right there. We're not going to hear about Pilate. We are going to hear about the resurrection in a moment. So we're going to go back to you guys um marry yourself almighty god for men um he did what he made worthy more worthy than all women and that's an allusion to what's called the magnificat where mary says you know that she will be blessed she will be you know called most blessed of all women etc okay pick up with 95 this i believe is the uh, yeah, this is the third now I or I now phrase that we're going to hear. Um, so somebody pick up with 95 and go to the end of 111. Now, itch the hata. The new itch the hata. Chelsea, is that you? Yeah. Okay. Now I will command the warriors of my beloved that this vision you tell to people. Reveal in words that it is the wonder tree that on which the, the Almighty God suffered for mankind's many sins and Adam's deeds of old. Okay, stop there. So notice the cross is still speaking. He's moved. We've already seen from the past to now the present, starting on line 78, he's gone to the present. But now what does he do? He issues a command. Commands always have to do with what? The future. I mean, there, you can issue a command in the present, but you can't fulfill it in the present, right? Because the fulfilling of it is bringing the future to come. So he issues this command that you do what? Tell people about what? 
It's ultimately about his vision, about this dream, that this is the tree on which Almighty God suffered for mankind's many sins and Adam's Ald Yewirkum, Ald, old works. What old works? What old deeds of Adam? Pluck. The fall. Okay? So we're, we're getting a lot of theological content now thrust into the poem. There's got to be a reason for that. All right, go on, Chelsea. Bearing his death, he tasted death. Yet afterwards, the Lord rose with his great power as a benefit to the people. He then ascended to heaven. Here afterwards, he will come in this world to seek out mankind on judgment day. The Lord himself, God Almighty, and his angels as well. Because when he wishes to judge, who possesses the power of judgment, each one, even as he for himself, earlier here in this transitory life, deserved. Okay, stop there. So go back for a moment to the Nicene Creed, ascended into heaven, he will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. Kingdom shall have no end. Okay, the Holy Spirit's going to be dealt with a little bit later. Um, okay, pick up somebody with 110. Then you can go to, works up pretty well, 126A, Yongu Huira. So before, before someone does, notice this is all part of the command. So go out and tell people, this is the cross what? This is the cross on which, and then that leads the cross to go into kind of the theological nature of the crucifixion, who Christ was, why he did what he did. So the cross, the, the poem has now become a means, I think at least, and quite a few others, of proselytizing. This is an evangelical tool, right? Uh, so somebody pick up a 110. On here. Okay. Nor will any there be unafraid because of the words the ruler will say. He will ask before the multitude where the person is who would taste bitter death in the Lord's name as he formerly did on the tree. Okay, stop there. Why is he going to ask that? What, is, what does that mean? He will um, ask who tasted bitterly of death. Does he mean, does the cross mean that literally? Who here was also crucified, you know, for Jesus? I don't think so. Means like, like who would be willing to? Who would be willing to? What do we hear Christ, for example, say several times in the Gospels? He who would follow me must do what? Take up his cross and deny himself. It, it's probably more that. Okay. Um, go ahead. Pick up. But then they will be afraid and scarcely imagine what they might begin to say to Christ. There is no need to be terrified for him who in his breast carries the best of trees. But through the cross shall the kingdom attain away from the earthly path, each soul which desires to dwell with the ruler. Okay, stop there. So, what, what do you think that means to stop doing that? Um, carry the cross in the breast. Is it like it's here somewhere? Is it like this? Carry the cross in the breast? So on a chain? Or is that metaphorical for have a belief in the cross? Because usually in Anglo Saxon poetry, when something is held in the breast, that's you know, those are the deepest, darkest things. You're gonna see when we get to the wanderer. Man, the wanderer's fantastic poem. Because the wanderer will repeatedly say things like, lock up in your breast horn the things you suffer, the things you endure, the things you feel. Right? For the simple reason that for that particular character, 
there's nobody else for him to express them to. And it doesn't do any good to express them, right? So the cross here means who has faith in me. Well, that's in the heart. It's in the chest, right? Um, and the soul will go away and dwell with the Lord in heaven. So pick up with 122. Uh, let me stop there for a second. What happens at the end of 121? Cross stops speaking. Cross stops speaking. So the cross is told the history and given a charge. Now, who's speaking? The guy who's having the dream. Exactly. We're back to the dreamer. So the dreamer opens. So here's the structure. The dreamer opens. The dreamer talks about, you know, wow, I had this vision. And then in the vision, the cross starts to speak. And the cross gives him a history lesson and then tells him whether he's asleep or not. <laughs> says, when you go forth from here, do this. Tell everybody to trust in me, and then they won't have to fear anything. Cross stops speaking, and then we get, Yabed itch me tha, and go ahead and finish translating those, or did you finish translating the few lines? Um, I think I've got a couple more. Okay. I prayed then to the tree with a, with a glad heart, great strength. There I was alone in small company. My spirit was urged on the journey ahead, experienced in all many periods of longing. Okay. And it's really cool, and I don't know that I intended this. Um, send an email out today. I can't remember. In the email that I sent out, did I say we were doing the Seafarer next week or the Wanderer? Head nodded Seafarer? I'm going to Okay. Yeah, that's what's on the schedule. I'm going to change that. I'm going to reverse those. And I'll, I'll do that. I'll send a revised email immediately after. So that we'll do the Wanderer, then the Seafarer. Um, for the simple reason that Following the dream of the rude, I hope you'll see the connection when I, when you translate the wonder. I don't want to uh, explicitly state it right now. So, the speaker has this vision and then says, I prayed to that, that beam, what's also called at various points a beacon, a sign, etc., Notice joyful or happy in spirit. El Nimiklet, kind of like with all my strength. Where I alone was with a small company. And there's that, that meta where that phrase that we saw earlier that referred to Christ alone in the cave, in the tomb. Right? So the speaker's all alone. Was mod sefa ephesid on fortwea. My spirit was urged on the journey. What journey? Well, what did the cross at least a bit talk about at the end of its charge, its command to the speaker? If you place your trust in me, if you place your faith in me, then what do you not need to fear? Death. When the soul leaves the body. Okay? They are the Aura Yabad Lamu Quila, line 125, experienced many of all periods of longing, or very many periods of longing. That modifies the fourth way. It's talking about the journey he has to go on. Um, have any of you read the late medieval play Every Man? You know, I have a journey shortly to go. What's, well, the journey is allegorical. It's death. Or Emily Dickinson's Because I Could Not Stop for Death, He Kindly Stopped for Me. Right? The speaker there is kind of implying, I'm too busy. I can't die yet. And, you know, death shows up. You're, you're never too busy for me. Right? Um, 
Somebody pick up with 126 uh, B. Is may nu livus hic. It is now my life's hope. What? And go to Well, there's not a good stuff. Um, just go to 140, the end of 140A. Okay. Now I hope for life is that I may seek the tree of victory more often alone than all other men to properly worship. The desire for that is great in my heart, and my hope of protection is directed to the cross. I do not have many powerful friends on earth, but they went forth from here from the joys of the world. They sought out for themselves the King of Glory, who now lives in the heavens with the High Father, to dwell in glory. And I expect for myself each day when the Lord's cross that I formerly beheld here on earth may fetch me from this transitory life and bring me then where happiness is great, joy in the heavens. Okay, stop there. Notice that line began, 131B, and is still running in the middle of 140. I mean, the, the dreamer is just building, building, building. Okay, so let's go back for a minute. Why possibly? So you're, you've got to read into it a little bit. Why possibly is the dreamer alone? What does he suggest or imply may be a reason? Or reasons, plural. What does he say about his friends or his? Go ahead. Go ahead, Harlow. Oh, sorry. I, I thought somebody else said something. Oh, well, it's well, he references that uh, uh, being poorly defended and having weak friends. Okay. And so it sort of suggests that that he could be in a community that, you know, was, had been attacked or had not been. Okay, I mean, entirely right. So he might be the only one left, right? He might be the last surviving member of his quote-unquote community. I mean, he says, they forth hin on, hence from here, the region of world uh, drama. They went, you know, leaving the joys of the world. That's, that's a euphemism for they passed on. Okay? Sought on him, wilderness kinning. They sought the king of the world. That's not like an emperor. That, that phrase refers to God. So his friends, his Lord, okay, they're dead. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean all of his friends are dead, but it imp I think the implication is, at the very least, those that he's close to, they've all gone on, and he's, he's still kicking, okay? And, and they live now in heaven with the, notice the, the great, I mean, it's a Germanic phrase, the high father. This is like language used to describe Odin, okay? Wooneeth on Woldra, dwell in glory. This is, again, this is the language of the Nicene Creed, right? And I expect to or for me, you know, every day when Christ's cross, Christ's rod or cross for me, which um, I hear on earth earlier beheld. Why does he say earlier beheld? This is kind of like the end of, um, oh, I hate it when that happens. Um, two roads in a wood. Robert Frost. 
Yes. Keep going. Yes. <laughs> total, total brain derailment. Robert Frost, um, what's the poem title? Divergent. Yeah, that's the poem, but what's the title? Uh, the Road Less Traveled. Um, that, what does the speaker say? I will be saying this years and years hence. It sounds like when that poem opens, the speaker is talking about now. And you get to the end of the poem and you realize the speaker is projected into the future, projecting into the back, into the past. So the speaker here, the dreamer here, is saying th what he's talking about right here. He's looking at it from a future perspective, looking back on the past. Before, when I first beheld Christ's cross, in this lean, transitory, lone, whatever life may fetch and bring me then, where what? Where is bliss Mitchell? Where is great bliss? Dram on heaven. Notice the word for dram, or, or notice what dram means. Joy. We think of dream as what? It's something fleeting, right? It happens at night and it doesn't last. Dram here in an Anglo Saxon, dram meant a joy. What we often think of as a dream, you know, is what they would have considered like a nightmare, but without the negative connotations, right? Somebody pick up with 141 and just go to the end. Well, let me do 141. Dream joy in heaven, where is or there is the people of the Lord, Vishnu's folk, or the Lord's people, Yeset and Tosimle, seated down for what? Simle, feast. It's the image that you get at the end of the book of Revelation. It's the wedding feast of the Lamb, the marriage feast of the Lamb. Right? There is single, meaning continuous, never ending bliss. And me, then, Asetta. The odd is indicating, and I will be placed there. I will be sat down at this table. Bear in mind, wh where do feasts happen in an Anglo-Saxon society? The central hall of the Lord. That central hall of the Lord, that's where everything important happens. That's where justice is dispensed. That's where kings, uh, where rings and wealth are distributed. You know, when the warriors, the thanes, bring the wealth back from battle, they give it to the Lord. It's in the hall that the Lord distributes it. It's in the hall where... You know, if one is blessed by the local Lord, you get to sit at the Lord's table, so to speak. There are other tables, but only those closest to him. And that's the image that's being used here. Where it's sitting mot wunion on wogra, where I may then dwell in glory. Well mid thom halgum dramas bruka. Well, your boss tells you fittingly, I think well works fine, with those hallowed, hallowed ones, saints, dramas, brukam. Brukam means to enjoy. To enjoy joys. <laughs> okay? Now somebody pick up with 144B and go to the end. And stop right after you do the first word. C. What does C mean? It's a form of the verb be. But it's future. It's be to me. Be to me. The Lord's friend. Or may I be the Lord's friend. 
Now somebody picked with 145. Anybody? Yeah, I can go. Carly? I can go off the, the, the rough. Uh, I lost my spot in the polish one. Uh, he went here on earth before suffered on the gallows tree for the sins of man. Uh, he set us free and gave us uh, his life uh, and heavenly home. Uh, hope was renewed with splendors and with happiness uh, uh, for them too. There the Keep going. Um, go to the end of 149 if you can. Okay. Uh, they're burning suffering. Right. They're those who they're endured burning suffering. Who's he talking about? This is what's called in um, medieval texts, it actually goes back earlier to the early church, the harrowing of hell. Referred to in um, one of Peter's letters. I can't remember which one. There might be, yeah, there's not a note here. I think there's a note in one of my books. Um, and it's talking about Christ in, when the body was in the tomb, uh, no, there's not. I was looking at something today that referred to it. Um, when the body was in the tomb, Christ's soul descended into hell. Oh, I know what it was. I was reading Dante for one of my other classes. Um, I'm going to say it's 2 Peter 3 or something like that. And Christ's soul descends to hell to reclaim the souls that looked forward to his coming, right? In the way Dante pictures it, beginning with Adam. So you get Adam and you get Abel and you get Seth and Noah and Abraham and Moses and David and all the prophets, blah, 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 all the way forward, okay? Um, the early fathers of the church don't limit it to those individuals. Let me rephrase that. Some of the early fathers. Shush. Um, some of the early fathers don't. Some of the early fathers essentially say that when Christ, quote unquote, harrowed hell, he went down, broke open the gates of hell so that there are no gates anymore. So, whenever that occurred, you know, whatever year, that from that point on, there are no gates in hell. Hell's a giant prison with no, no cell doors. So the only people, according to the fathers of the church, in hell after that time are those who want to be there. Because from that time forward, those who go to hell, go to hell because they choose to go to hell, essentially. So since Harlow did through 149, anybody want to pick up with 150 and do, I don't know, they could do the rest. You get, you get part of the really good part. The son was, go ahead, Lainey. I said, I can't understand. I had it split up from a little bit differently, so I'm trying to see 150. The son was victorious on the expedition, mighty and successful, when the multitude came with a host of spirits into God's kingdom. The ruler almighty, as a joy to the angels and all the saints who formerly lived in glory in the heavens, when their ruler came, almighty God, there his homeland was. Good. Perfect conclusion. So, you've almost got there, you know, the end of the creed. I, in, Look up the just look up the Nicene Constantum. I can't say it. Um, creed on uh, the internet. We're all posted to the class. The poet has seemingly followed that, and I think there's a couple of reasons. And your your introduction talks about um, you know some of the reasons possibly for the poem being written and such. And and let me offer a couple of possibilities. And one or two of your articles, I think. Um, dealt with this topic as well. September 14th, in one of the Sundays in, in what's called Great Lit, okay, are 
set aside days for the adoration of the cross in the, in the church. Okay, um, September fourteenth is the exaltation of the cross, and then um, one of the set. And it varies between the east and the west, which is why I'm not labeling those specific Sundays. Um, one of the Sundays in Lent is for the exaltation of the precious and life-giving cross, okay? And it seems to me this poem could have been written, could have been written, kind of as a corollary for one of those two days, right? Because it follows the history of the cross, I mean, it gives its founding, all that kind of stuff. But because it, it's also very doctrinal, the poem is. And it seems to me the doctrinal nature of the poem could have been because the poem was used, as I alluded to earlier, as, a, as an evangelistic tool. See, the, we don't know when the poem was written. We do know that the, the rival cross that it survives on, part of it survives on, let me go to, hold on. Back to that page. Now to it. This is just the Wikipedia site. Um, the rival cross that you have an image of here, okay. Dates from the early 8th century. I mean, most scholars date it from 700 to latest 750, right? So let me back. Um, you've got a bunch of images down at the bottom. Um, well, it has inscribed on it that portion where we read about Christ was on the cross. You know, I was raised up and then Christ was on the cross. That's there. So if it dates from 700 or so, even though here on Wikipedia, many believe that the runes, as opposed to the Latin inscriptions, were added later, possibly as late as the 10th century. Yeah, I don't know that I'd say many. I, you know, some do, but not many. Um, if part of the poem dates to the early 7th century, then it's very likely, especially the middle part of the then it's very likely that the rest of the poem does too. Okay, so 700 to 750. Britain only had Roman Christianity, late Roman Christianity, let's say, enter in 597 with St. Augustine. So this is still within 100, 150 years of that. We know that there was a dominant heresy common in early Christian Anglo-Saxon England. That heresy was called Pelagianism, okay? Um, because Pelagius was a British monk, okay? And it seems to me one of the things the poem is doing is it's countering some of, some of Pelagius's heretic teachings, you know, regarding the divinity of Christ and how one achieves heaven and things like that. You can look it up, you know, just look up Pelagius or Pelagian heresy and you can read about it. Because what the poem does is the poem kind of goes down to the, um, the doctrinal grocery list, so to speak, and hits all the major small o orthodox points. In other words, it gets all of its doctrinal ducts lined up in a row. Make sure it hits, you know, virgin birth, Jesus fully man, fully God. You know, Jesus is the only way. The cross is the only way. It's not, you know, it's more restored approach kind of, a, kind of a, um, an idea. And there have been a lot of articles um, written about this. The one that I mentioned by Grasso or Doug Grasso talks about the liturgical influences in the dream of the root and the dream of the root possibly on liturgy in Anglo-Saxon England. Um, my last comment is going to be, 
since I moved the Wanderer next, I hope you'll see, possibly, a connection between the speaker of this poem and the speaker of the Wanderer. And I'm not saying there is a connection. I'm, I'm emphatically not saying the speaker of the dream or the root is the speaker of the wander. But there are interesting parallels between them. Also between them and the speaker of the seafarer. Okay. Um, there seems to be this dominant, a dominant motif that runs throughout Anglo-Saxon and possibly English literature, at least up through the 19th century, of this interest in this last survivor kind of speaker. For example, think of Moby Dick. How many of you have read Moby Dick? A few of you have. I've got a PhD. I've never finished it. I, 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 I get lost in the whale stuff. Um, but Who's the speaker? Who's narrating all of Moby Dick? Ishmael, right? It begins, call me Ishmael. Why? He's the last survivor. Um, Ram of the Ancient Mariner. He's the last survivor. Okay? You, you get this idea of a single person surviving, and it kind of, it, it trickles, let's say, throughout a lot of English literature. There's, there's something going on there. I'm not sure why, but it figures. So just kind of keep that idea in mind as you read The Wanderer. And we're going to see a passage when we get to Beowulf next spring. There's this, what's often called a digression or episode in Beowulf called The Lay of the Last Survivor. And it's pretty important for the entirety um, of the poem. Okay, any questions or comments? Uh, the email I sent out previously, which I'm going to revise in just a few minutes, um, also made a comment about papers. Let me know by next week what you're writing about, um, what, what your general topic is. I don't need a thesis or anything like that. Just, you know, send me a sentence, paragraph, whatever, just what your topic is. And if it's something I have some knowledge of, I, you know, may try to send you in a direction for some sources or something like that. Okay. All right. That's all I have for today. Thank you all. If anybody needs to speak to me, let me know. Uh, and I'll, I won't shut the video down immediately. All right. I'm going to stop recording.